Well, good morning. Good morning. A good time with the men's breakfast yesterday. I want to thank all the guys for coming out. It was really a powerful morning, I thought. Did a great job with Rodney speaking, and and Bob Little gave his testimony, which was so powerful. And Bob, you had said something yesterday that you were going to use some language that went over some people's heads. Um, You're like 9 2, man. Literally everything you say goes over my head. So (laughs) thank you for that yesterday. That was my best shot at a short joke, sorry. <laughs> All right. So if you would, please open up your Bibles to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. And we're going to go through the text, obviously, this morning. I'm not going to read it first, because if you happen to not know the end of the story, I want you to be surprised. <laughs> For those of you who do, I want you to forget that you know the end of the story, Okay. We're going to build some drama here this morning. This is the sacrifice of Isaac, or as the Jews to this day call it, the binding of Isaac. And so if you know the story about Abraham being asked to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering, the first question, perhaps really the only question that one might have when hearing this text or reading through it is, how could God ask Abraham to offer his son Isaac? Isaac as a sacrifice. This just doesn't compute with us, does it? I'm not going to answer that question now. And the second question may be this. Okay, so I know the story, but what does this have to do with me, a post-New Testament Christian, today? I'm not going to answer that question right now either. A third question might be this. How did we arrive here at this point in Abraham's history? That question also, I'm just kidding, we'll, we'll answer that one now. We're going to start with that. So the Lord just saying for this morning, for Genesis 22, really is found several chapters back, ultimately in Genesis 12, but mainly in Genesis 17, which is that great chapter on the covenant that God makes with Abram. He says this, Behold, my covenant is with you, And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring. Keep that in mind. After you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. And moreover, I will give her a son. I will bless her, and she, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Legitimate question. Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. And so we have this great covenant with Abraham, and if you didn't notice, it's centered around a child, a son. Now at this point in history, obviously, Ishmael exists. Isaac is not born yet. But he, as it's made very clear, is not the covenant son. He is not the son of promise. Rather, a son who is yet to be born... For all purposes, by a miracle, he will be the immediate offspring. And so I want you to understand that from the starter, because this really sets the drama up this morning, that Abraham at first wanted Ishmael to be the promised one. Oh, let Ishmael live before you. God says, no, he's not going to be the covenant one. And so you can see a bit of reluctance in his laughter, in his response to God. But God in a sovereign plan is going to ordain things this morning in such a way 
that adds to the drama of what we're going to go through in Genesis 22. In fact, I would dare say that even though the story of Isaac is very familiar to us, if you've been in church for any length of time, you really can't understand the gravity of what happens of the situation unless you first understand what comes before it. This is why God gives us things before the things He tells us. So if you're in Genesis 17 and you flip over to 21, I'll I'll read it for you. We read that true to His word, the great covenant God Yahweh does exactly as He promised for Abraham. It says this, the Lord visited Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as He had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And so now, at this point, is really where we get the setup for this chapter. So Abraham, after Isaac is born, makes a great feast, and due to some very unscrupulous things, we won't go into it here this morning, which I don't have the time to explain, it comes about that Sarah demands that Hagar and that slave boy, Ishmael, be cast out because of something that Ishmael had done to Isaac. We then read this, and the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. This was his boy. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. Now it seems like a smaller detail that he he does this before he sacrifices Isaac, but it really does set the stage for what we're talking about here. Here's the thing. I want you to kind of enter into the story this morning. God's the greatest storyteller that's ever been. And I want you to enter this story. We never read that Abraham ever saw Ishmael again. When he sent him away, that was it. His oldest son, who was probably late teens, maybe early 20s at this point, is gone. And we know that God took care of him. We don't know if Abraham really grasp what was happening and that God was going to take care of him. He promised he would, but does Abraham really know that? Have you ever had to send a child away not knowing really what's going to happen? You can have all the promises in the world, but you don't know. So for all intents and purposes, to Abraham, Ishmael was as good as dead. And so with that in mind, as we are readers of Genesis, we are then introduced to Genesis 22. And although years have passed between the last verse of 21 In the first verse of 22, at least a decade, maybe a little bit more, the narrator builds the drama that we're going through this morning immediately after the previous drama of Ishmael being sent away. So I want you to understand that. After these things, it says, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now at this point in his life, God has called Abraham to do some very difficult things. Starting with the original call, Abraham, I want you to leave your home, your family, everything you knew, all your religion, and I want you to go to a land I'm going to show you, even if you don't know where it is. Just drop everything and you follow me. So that's the first thing. Everything he knew, everything he worshipped, He was to go to a new place which he didn't know yet. A land that was promised to him, by the way, and a land that he never owned. Think about that. He was promised the land and he owned a very small patch when you read about that here in a couple chapters. But other than that, he didn't own any of this land that was promised to him. So he lived as a resident alien. And then as we read moments ago, God asked him to listen to Sarah when Sarah got upset and to depart with his son Ishmael to send him away forever. So Abraham, at 100 years old, has not had an easy life. And now he's asked to sacrifice Isaac as a test. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham. But let us not be confused here. As we wrestle in our minds with what kind of a God we profess to serve, would ask one who followed him to sacrifice a human being, I don't want to get lost in in this fact, which is the difference between tested and tempted. God does not tempt people. The Bible makes that clear in James. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But then, what is the test? If it's not temptation, what is it? Well, according to Mr. Webster in his dictionary, he has several things listed there. He says this, A test is something such as a series of questions or exercises for measuring the skill, knowledge, intelligence, capacities, or aptitudes of an individual or group. A procedure used to identify or characterize a substance or constituent. A critical examination, observation, or evaluation, or an ordeal or oath required as proof of conformity with a set beliefs. So a test in and of itself is neutral. It's a test. And this command of God was Abraham's ordeal or his exercise, his procedure, his critical examination. What was the man made of? Did he truly believe the promises that were given to him in Genesis 17? That's what we're going to find out. Did he believe in them no matter what? It wasn't just like he was asked to wait a long time. He was asked to sacrifice Isaac. Now, testing, as one commentator put it, says it shows what someone is really like, and it generally involves difficulty or hardship. It's supposed to reveal something. And so we're going to find out what it reveals about Abraham this morning, which is different than tempting, because tempting is enticing someone to do evil. Testing is to see what they are. Now again, so since most of us, I want to assume all of us, know the end of the story, we kind of downplay this idea of a test. Well, it was just a test, right? I mean, God wasn't really going to have Abraham sacrifice Isaac. And if that's your reaction to this text, then you've missed the point. Tell that to the student who's trying to get into college that the SAT is just a test. Tell that to the promising young law student when they have to take the bar exam and it's just a test. Tell that to the man who's asked to walk a line in front of an officer. It's just a sobriety test. Tell that to the cancer patient when they have to do a biopsy. Tell them it's, it's just a test. Now the test reveals a lot, doesn't it? You tell that to this man Abraham who didn't know this was a test, but he did know that he had a command from God to sacrifice his son. And then you think about the tester. This wasn't Satan. This is not a repeat of, of Job's story where God gives Satan free reign to go and tempt, or to, uh, to tempt Job. No, God here is the tester of Abraham. It was the Lord, Yahweh. And so why would the Lord test Abraham? That's another good, good question. Was there something he didn't know about Abraham? Was he looking for knowledge? Was he unsure of Abraham's real faithfulness? Was he just being cruel in Abraham to, to do the unthinkable and just to torture him and then at the end say, just kidding? Now, the Bible declares that God is omniscient, that he knows all things. So why then? Well, remember, a test is given to reveal something. And we're going to see what it reveals. And so then think of the test itself. God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. See the narrator is rubbing it in. Take your son, your only son, the one you love. You know that kid that I promised to give you and I gave it to you, the one you love. Goes around with you everywhere, that little boy. Take him. You know that one, Isaac. The one you got, the one you love, take him. Right? He's repeating it. And this is exactly why God ordained the history the way that he did, like I said this morning. The sending away of Ishmael had to take place before this event so that those words could be used in, in a true manner. And what piercing words there must have been to Abraham? Take your son, singular. Now he only has one, because Ishmael's gone. Your only son, Isaac. It's repeated to emphasize the point to the reader. Your son, your only son, Isaac. And then that third description, whom you love, to establish that relationship even more so. It wasn't like Abraham didn't like the kid, right? That tells him, the one you love, Isaac, take him. The point is being, uh, the point is being made that this is Abraham's beloved son. The son that Abraham was promised, by the way, by God, whom he loved. And then the use of his name, when God says, take Isaac reminds him of what Abraham or what Isaac's name meant, right? Laughter. So take your laughter, take your joy, the one I gave you, and go sacrifice him on a mountain that I'm going to show you. Now at my job, I'm a big believer in what we call breadcrumbs. When I train people, we do this thing called breadcrumbs, which is you leave little bits of information here and there so that a year later when you 
don't remember at all what you did and why you did it, you're able to find it and track it down. Right? You take this number over here, you put it over there, you take this number from this one, go put it over there, we work with lots of different systems. The only way we can keep sense of all, the thing, of all those things is if you have a way to backtrack and find out uh, where you're going to go with it. Right? And so God in the Bible, I think, is an amazing, uh, amazing thing. He has left breadcrumbs for us. And I'm going to give them to you for your notes. If you're a note-taking person, I'm going to give you the breadcrumbs, then we'll t- come back like Nancy Drew at the end and solve the mystery, okay? So here's the first one. Breadcrumb number one. The only son who was loved. The only son who was loved. At this point, there was no one else. Isaac, at this point, is it. At this point, Abraham's not a Franco. He doesn't have you know, 14 other kids to, to <laughs> use, right? At least not at this point in his life. But as dear as that father-son relationship is, the, that wasn't the only thing at stake here, and I want you to understand that. As mentioned a few moments ago, this was about the promise. So it's not just Isaac hanging in the balance here, it's God's entire promise to Abraham that's hanging in the balance here. As one commentator put it, he said this, Isaac was the embodiment of all God's promises. Isaac was the focal point of all Abraham's hopes. And now God asked Abraham to offer Isaac on the altar as a burnt offering. So in other words, God asked Abraham to turn laughter into smoke. Now think about that as well. This wasn't just a run-of-the-mill sacrifice. God said to offer his son as a burnt offering. This wasn't a, we'll pull the band off real quick and I'll stab in the neck of the heart and it'll be over and I want to look. That's not what this was. It was a total dismemberment and then burning until nothing was left. So think about that. It wasn't just he was going to, to slit Isaac's throat to offer him. It was that a burnt offering required that you dismembered the thing, put it on an altar, and then burned it so nothing would remain of it. But isn't this the same God who warned Israel not to imitate the Canaanites in burning their children to their pagan gods? Was this a contradiction to his own law later on? Later on in Exodus, we find that God actually required all the firstborns to be given to him. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your, pre- of your presses, the firstborn of your sons, you shall give to me. God owned them. So really, God is ask, as asking Abraham here, are you as faithful to me as the pagans are to their gods? So in reality, God wasn't asking for anything that wasn't already his. He already owned Isaac. And we're going to come back to that later. I want you to notice also where this was to take place. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So there for your note takers is breadcrumb number two, Moriah. As if the task itself and the request that God makes of Abraham isn't enough. He's asked to go on a journey to arrive at the spot where he's going to do this. Why couldn't he have taken Isaac just outside? I mean, Abraham built altars all over the place. Why couldn't he just take them outside and do the deed there and and be done with it? No, see, that was part of the test. Abraham was going to have to think about it. And the longer you wait on something, this is true for me, the harder it is to do. If you have a task you need to do and you just don't want to do it and you just wait, it becomes harder because it's in your mind and you can't get away from it. It's like, ah. And so Abraham has to wait now. I want to come back in a minute to how long that journey was. I want to point out something else here. So the next verse says this, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Notice here that Abraham's obedience is immediate and absolute. He doesn't wait a week saying, I've got to finish some things up, God. I'll get to it. No, the next morning he rises early to start the preparations. He doesn't pro- uh, procrastinate. He rises early in the morning and he makes the necessary preparations and he goes. The same thing we read about the last difficult task that God had for him when he sent Ishmael away. That too, we read, so Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar and sent them away. So Abraham's obedience is immediate. As Robin Conwell used to to, to put it, and I, I like this saying, delayed obedience is disobedience. But we don't see that here with Abraham. No, this man of faith is resolute. He doesn't linger. He rises early. 
He does what needs to be done. So such obedience found in you. You're not Abraham, but you're still a servant who needs to obey. The other thing, notice that he doesn't complain. He doesn't argue with God. He doesn't talk back to him. He doesn't question why. And that's really strange when you think about it, because just a few chapters prior, when it came to Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham had this conversation with God. Don't do it, God. If there's even 50, will you do it? And he's pleading with them over the city. But when it comes to his own son, Abraham is silent. But you notice something else strange at this point. Abraham rises early, he prepares the wood, he saddles the donkey. There's someone missing. Moms? Sarah isn't mentioned anywhere in the story. Now there's, there's some debate here on whether Sarah at this point was actually already dead, and this is not chronological, or I tend to think that she's still alive and she, we just don't hear from her, right? Now moms, I don't want you to let this prevent you from letting your sons go to the men's breakfast, Okay. <laughs> Where are you going? Men's breakfast and sacrifice the son. What did God tell you to do? Yeah, that kind of a thing. But there's no record also about anything on this journey that he goes on until they actually see the place of where they're going. So now we find out how long the journey has taken. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So there's breadcrumb number three for you. The third day. Now, can you imagine being asked to do what God has asked Abraham to do and then having to journey for three days with that thought rattling around in your head as your boy's by your side that eventually we're going to get to this place and I'm going to have to kill him? It wasn't immediate. It wasn't a passionate thing. It was a slow, deliberate, thought-out process that God says, you go here and do this. And so the whole way there, Abraham's thinking about this. And so the drama really builds in the Hebrew, and this is something you don't get from English translations, but... It says, Abraham lifted up his eyes. And so to us, we think, well, duh, if you're going to see where you're going, you have to lift up your eyes, right? But in Scripture, when it says the phrase, looked up or lifted up your eyes before seeing something, it usually means that what is about to be seen is of great significance or importance. Like, this is a big deal. He lifted up his eyes, and behold, there it was. Okay? So, for instance, if you go back to chapter 18, it says that Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the three visitors from, from heaven before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Big deal, right? Or later when uh, Jacob says that he it lifts up his eyes, and behold, and he saw Esau coming, like, oh no, right? Esau's coming after me. So anytime they lift up their eyes and they see, it means it's a big deal. And so imagine then, if you will, Abraham is contemplating this, this request from the Lord for three days as they draw near to the place. And yet nearer still, he lifts up his eyes and he sees the place from afar, this mountain, where his boy is going to be killed by his hand. So think of, oh, it's a dumb analogy, but think of like Frodo and Sam, right? They look up and they see Mount Doom in Mordor. Like, oh, that's what it's experiencing. Not that I'm comparing Abraham to Frodo and Sam. Okay, don't email me about that. But So as soon as Abraham sees the place, this mountain that God points him to, we read this. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Notice he says worship. Now they probably had a clue because he had wood and he had the fire and he had the knife, what was happening. But he says, we're going to go worship. He doesn't say, I'm going to go burn my son and dismember him and then I'll be back. Right? So this is either a small white lie or it's a demonstration of Abraham's faith. And I tend to think it's the latter. He doesn't say, I will come again to you, but it's plural. He says, I and the boy will go over and come again to you, meaning both of them. Would they? <laughs> well, Hebrews 11 says this. We have a little bit of insight into what Abraham is thinking, a little bit. It says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even to raise him from the dead. So he didn't know how, he didn't know what, but he knew that God could do it. That somehow, him and Isaac were going to return. Maybe he meant, I'll be carrying what's left of my boy to you. We don't know. But at least with Hebrews 11, we have some idea that God was going to make this happen. 
And so I want you to know that it also took nothing away from this test, even if Abraham believed this. I mean, think about if it was you, standing over your own child, and you know that God can bring people back from the dead, but you still are supposed to slit his throat. That wouldn't make you feel any better. So no, the young men now must stay behind because now Abraham is going to go up on a mountain as a priest and offer a sacrifice. They're going to go to holy ground. So the young men must stay behind. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and so both of them went together. There's breadcrumb number four. Wood laid on the sun. Now, we don't know exactly how old Isaac is at this point, but most commentators think it's somewhere between 10 and 15, somewhere in there. Old enough, at least for the journey, for conversations we're going to see in a minute, and strong enough to carry a load of wood, you know, for the offering, even though he was unaware that he was the victim. And in a Jewish midrash, which is a commentary on the scriptures, there's this comment that Isaac, with the wood on his back, is like a condemned man carrying his own instrument of death. And so, in fact, what we are witnessing, according to another commentator, is a gem of Old Testament literary art. It says, so they both of them, both of them, together, they went. Suggesting that both their isolation, both of them, separately, and their companionship, together, they alone climb up this mountainside. And so as they're climbing, you don't know how long it's taking place, but... Let me read this. Isaac said to his father, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Awkward. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And then that's the end of the conversation. And that's breadcrumb number five. God will provide for himself the lamb. So here again, we see Abraham's faith. God had given him a promise, and God would provide the fulfillment of that promise, even if it didn't make sense in the moment. And so he had to to, to balance this. He had to harmonize the command to sacrifice Isaac with the promise that in in, in Isaac, his offspring would be reckoned. So he had to balance these two things. I have to kill Isaac, but in Isaac, I get the promise. And he he had to balance both of them. And so that's the end of that brief conversation. And then we read again that phrase, so they both of them went together. He doesn't say anything more, at least that's recorded. Neither does Abraham. So we don't know what Isaac is thinking either. Does he see through this shred that, oh, maybe it's me? Does he just trust what his dad's telling him that eventually somehow this will work out? We don't know. But at this point, the narrative slows down again. So if you're reading, it's kind of fast paced. Then it has a couple of slow spots. And here's one of them. So when they came to the place of which God had showed them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now we know this as the the sacrifice of Isaac. That's how we know the story. Again, I mentioned before, the Jews call this the akadah, or the binding of Isaac, from this phrase that he was bound. Now there is no record that Isaac fought back We don't know how it transpired that it was bound, that if Abraham said, get on the wood and I'll bind you up, or don't worry about it. I know it seems weird, but it'll be okay. We don't know. But the sacrifice was prepared. The victim was made ready. And this was was Abraham's faith in action. So it's one thing to proclaim your faith. It's another thing to demonstrate it, isn't it? And this is the point of what James says. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And at this point, when Isaac is laid on the altar, that's what James claims Abraham, or that's when he claims Abraham was justified. James continues here. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? So it's at this point where James claims that Abraham was justified. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So again, I think we're so familiar with that verse, we kind of forget the context. It says Abraham believed God, but believed him about what? That God would deliver on this promise that he would still have this offspring in the midst of what he was doing. 
That belief was counted to him as righteousness, but it was proved out by his works. So it was credited to him as righteousness, but until they laid Isaac on the altar, that's when it was demonstrated. This is exactly what the test was supposed to reveal. Even when God commanded the unthinkable, Abraham obeyed. So then back to our narrative. There is the boy laid on the wood, on the altar. And again, I was thinking, can you imagine being the Israelites reading this story for the first time or hearing it? What, are they, what were they thinking? And they knew that their entire existence, their entire nation depended on the promise that God had made to Abraham. And here's the subject of that promise bound and about ready to be offered up as a sacrifice. And yet, here they are as a nation, they're all standing there. So what happened? Did God bring Isaac back from the dead? Did Abraham refuse to go through with it and Isaac lived? What happened? So verse 10, then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. So you see the tension is building here? It's thick. So thick, you might cut it with a knife. That was bad, sorry. But Isaac is seconds away from being slaughtered. His life hangs in the balance. Abraham's obedience will be complete. And the promise itself hangs on the tip of that knife. And then something absolutely amazing happens. So he has the knife. And that word there means to cut body parts, by the way. It was a sacrificial knife. He has the knife, and then the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so there's breadcrumb number six. The son's life was not withheld. The son's life was not withheld. And so just at the last instant, the angel of the Lord, I want to point this out here, not an angel, but the angel of the Lord, who I submit to you as Yahweh himself, better known to us as the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, calls urgently to Abraham and stops him. I want to point out two things at this point. First, the angel says, for now I know that you fear God. That's not to be taken as if God didn't know right, that Abraham feared him, but rather that the test is complete and now it's been revealed to the reader that Abraham does in fact truly believe God. And second is look who is talking and what is said. The angel of the Lord, now think about this for a minute. The angel of the Lord calls from heaven saying, now I know you fear God. So the angel is saying, now I know you fear God. And how does the angel know this? The angel gives a reason. Seeing as you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See what's going on there? I know you fear God because you haven't withheld your only son from me. That's Yahweh, who identifies himself as that generic term of Elohim, which is God. And that's the second thing to note here. In the beginning of the narrative, this is what I love about, about Hebrew scripture. In the beginning of the narrative, we read that God, or that word there is Elohim, tested Abraham. That's the generic word for God. So, you know, the, the Canaanites had their Elohim. You know, I think even um, um, Samuel, when he came up as a spirit, is labeled as an Elohim. But once God, the angel of the Lord, steps in and saves Isaac from death, their narrative now refers to his covenant name, the angel of Yahweh. So he goes from being Elohim to Yahweh. At this point, though, even though the, the knife has been stayed, God still required a burnt offering. He didn't revoke the command. So Abraham had told Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb. And after the angel of the Lord stops Abraham from plunging the knife into his son, we read this. And Abraham looked up. There's that phrase again. He looked up, lifted up his eyes. Something significant is about to be seen. He lifts up his eyes and looks and behold, behind him, which I think is referring to the angel of the Lord, was a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. So Abraham believed God would provide and God provided. And because God provided, Isaac gets to live. And remember what I said earlier about that the firstborn were owed to God? If God wanted to take them and have all of them sacrificed, he could do that. That was his right as God. But God also in his grace and mercy 
specifically put in a required alternative to this offering. And that would be that the children could be redeemed with a substitute. So you have a first glimpse of that here with Isaac, that Isaac belonged to God. He should have been offered, but God said, I will allow it if there's a substitute. Isn't that amazing? So Abraham took, went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son, instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, which is where we get the term Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord will provide, or that Hebrew word that's translated provide there means see, the Lord will see or see to it. So when you ask someone to do something, yeah, I'll see to it. I'll, I'll get there. I'll, I'll see to it. That's what the word means that the Lord would tend to it, that he would provide, that he would see that the matter was completed. In other words, the point of the narrative is exactly this. You want to know what Genesis 22 is about? Yahweh sees. Yahweh provides. So going back to the text, then the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So that's three times. Isaac, the Lord will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, the Lord shall provide, I'm sorry, the Lord has provided, and now it says, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now notice that little tiny word there. Again, details, God doesn't give us useless information. The Lord did provide, and yet there's a futuristic tone in that word shall. It shall be provided. So the form of that word expresses a future tense, a strong assertion or intention to do something. Which means, beloved, that as much as the Lord provided here in this moment, Yahweh wasn't done. More would be provided later. Or another way to translate the last part of that is on the mount of the Lord, the Lord will be seen. So even so, the Lord is not yet done with Abraham here in this narrative. So verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have, sweared, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your, your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So he reiterates to, those, to him the, the promises of Genesis 17 again that the, the promise of the offspring, they will surely be multiplied. But then he says something interesting here. I don't know if you caught that or not. He said, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. So that's breadcrumb number seven, the gate of his enemies. He switches from the plural to the singular. The possessing the gate is achieved by one of Abraham's offspring, not all of them. An important distinction is made here between the patriarch's many descendants and a special future descendant who will come from this unique family line. That's what's being said in this passage here. Meaning, yes, Abraham will have lots of kids, lots of offspring, but there's one in particular that's going to be distinguished from the rest, so stay tuned. So after all this drama, the tension, the test, the reassurance of the promise, Isaac is spared, and it has shown that the Lord has indeed provided, true to his word. Now Abraham is able to go back and be true to his word to the young men, as we read this. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. So he told them, we'll come back to you again, and they did. So what's the point of this chapter? Well, mainly, it's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord provides, the Lord will see. But now we get to go to the breadcrumbs. What other story is the greatest storyteller relaying to us through this chapter? So now we get to follow the trail. You excited? Breadcrumb number one, the son, the only son who was loved. Well, we find this picked up in the Gospels at the baptism of Jesus. And we read, Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And of course, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So that's the breadcrumb number one. Number two, 
I said that breadcrumb was Moriah. Well, it turns out there's a reason that God chose that mountain and that region for Abraham to do this. 2 Chronicles 3.1 says this, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father. So what mountain did, it, would, did God choose? The temple site. Think of that. 2,000 years, he picks the temple site. And that's where Jesus was crucified. Breadcrumb number three was the third day. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw the place from afar. And on that third day, according to the verse we read from Hebrews earlier, Abraham, at least figuratively speaking, says the author of Hebrews, received Isaac back from the dead. Sound familiar? Well, Jesus is opening up the scriptures to his disciples, and he says this in Luke, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So breadcrumb number four. The wood was laid on Isaac. As they ascended the mountain, Isaac is carrying the wood that he's going to be sacrificed on. And John records for us this, that they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull. Breadcrumb number five was the phrase that Abraham used in answering Isaac, that God would provide for himself a lamb for the sacrifice. John the Baptist recognized this immediately. He said this, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold, the lamb of God, meaning the lamb that God provided, who takes away the sin of the world. And Paul then picks this up later on. He says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Breadcrumb number six. The son's life was not withheld. The son's life was not withheld. That's what the angel Lord told Abraham. You have not withheld your only son from me. And neither did our heavenly father. For in Romans we read this. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And finally, breadcrumb number seven. The gates of the enemy is that he, Abraham's offspring, would possess the gate of his enemies. And remember I said that one of his offspring would do this, not all of them. Now Paul informs us in Galatians about who that offspring is. Spoiler, it's Jesus. This is what Paul says. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And then listen to what this offspring says in the Gospels. When he's talking to Peter, he says, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. He's going to own the gate of his enemies. So I want to go back to the very beginning of the sermon. I put out that question. How could God ask Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice? Even knowing what we do about how it turned out, how could God how could a good God ask such a thing of a parent? Such an unthinkable thing. It's because 2,000 years after Abraham and Isaac walked up that mountain, another son, an only begotten son who was loved by his father, would walk up that same mountain. But this time there would be no intervention from heaven, no voice to stay the knife. This time the knife would be used. It would please the Father to bruise him. This time there would be no substitute ram caught in the thicket because this son is the substitute. And when Isaac inquired about the animal for the offering, he said, my father. And Abraham said, here I am, my son. But for this son, when he cried out to his father, there was no answer. The only response was silence. Followed by his own cry, why have you forsaken me? So how could God, a good God, ask a father to sacrifice his only son? Well, the answer is this, because he asked no more of Abraham than he did himself. 
So this then answers the second question that was asked, what does this have to do with me as a post-New Testament Christian? Everything. The Lord provided a ram that Isaac would live. God provided a son that we might live. There's a blessed substitute. Is he yours? The Lord has provided. The Lord has seen to it. Believe it. So that's the end of the story in Genesis 22, but you'll notice that it isn't the end of the chapter. You notice that? If you're in Genesis 22, that's not where the chapter ends. After all that went on, all this drama, the intensity, the wrestling with the questions, we get one more piece of information that it seems so small. I'm a fan of the of, of Marvel Universe, right? And so if you've been to a Marvel movie, you know that at the very end, they always do a post-credit scene, which is supposed to be kind of like this wow thing about what's coming next, right? And this is what we get here in Genesis 22. Isaac is saved, he lives, and then we read that was told to Abraham, oh, and by the way, children have been born to your brother Nahor, Uz, Buzz, I'm going to name my twins up here, but I have twins, Camuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hezo, Pildash, Jephthah, and Bethuel. And Bethuel, by the way, he fathered a girl named Rebekah and seen. Isaac is now the focal point of what's going forth in Genesis, and we get a hint of Rebekah, because obviously that's going to become Isaac's wife, which doesn't happen if Isaac doesn't live. And so one last thing, so indulge me here, we're almost done. This narrative also, I believe, solves one more mystery in Scripture, at least that I've always had. We have in the New Testament that familiar verse in which Jesus says that Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day he saw it was glad. So the question that is asked is, when did Abraham see this? Here's Spurgeon's answer. I think I was going to get one in, didn't you? I tend to agree with him. When did Abraham see Christ? On top of Moriah, when his own son was on the wood, and his own hand was lifted up. He must have seen the Son of God and the uplifted hand of God offering the great sacrifice. When he took the ram from the thicket, and so save the life of his son, how clearly he must have understood that blessed doctrine of substitution, which is the very center of the gospel. I have no other hope than this, nor can I conceive of anything else that would be good news to me but the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that there was offered another life instead of mine through which I live. By a life I do not live, and by a death I do not die. I am saved. So it was with Isaac, when he was saved by the ram taken in the thicket. It was worthwhile for Abraham thus to be tested to have a view of Christ. So may our tests and trials be of that same worthiness that we might get a view, a glimpse of Jesus Christ, knowing that the Lord has provided. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled by the way you've put Scripture together, we are humbled by what you asked Abraham to do, knowing it was a, a means to reveal your son to us. Now, while Isaac was spared, your son was not, and because of that, we live. He had no substitute because he was the substitute. I pray that anyone in here who does not know that, who does not realize that in faith, for themselves, that you would draw them to you. That they would rely and depend on Jesus as a substitute. Because he was offered up as sin, as the guilt bearer for us. Thank you. I place things in the name of your Son, our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.